Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I am going to place a vicegerent on earth. The Arabic word is Khalifa. It means a representative or an emissary of mine. And they said, the angels said, Will you place therein one who will spread corruption and shed blood while we celebrate your praises and glorify your holiness? And God said, he said, Truly I know what you do not know. See, that's the verse that hooked me. That's the verse that caught my attention. That's the one that kept on making me read the story again and again and again. Because listen to the way it begins. Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I'm going to place a representative of mine on earth, a vicegerent of mine, an emissary, one who acts on my behalf. I thought, that, that's not the way it goes. You're not supposed to be placing man on the earth in some positive role. You place man as a, on earth as a punishment for his sin. Clearly I knew the author didn't quite get the point. But still, it was an amazing line. But then I come to the next line and it says, And the angels say, Will you place her in one who will spread corruption and shed blood? While we celebrate your praises and glorify you? I looked at it again. I couldn't believe the question. I looked at that and I said, Exactly. That would be my question. Why would you create this being, supposedly for some positive role when he's capable of doing tremendous wrongdoing, when he could spread corruption and shed much blood. Why would you create this violent and pernicious creature when you could create angels, as the angels clearly say, while we, while we the angels, celebrate your praises and glorify you? They were asking one of the most fundamental questions in the entire history of religion. Why create you, man, this utterly fallible creature, this creature who could rebel against God's will, who could do such tremendous wrongdoing, who could wreak havoc like no other creature on earth, when you can make him angels? That whole question, everything that I ever thought, everything that I ever experienced, everything that I ever knew was in that question. It was as if the author took my life and wanted to pick out exactly the right question to humiliate me, to provoke me, to anger me. Why create man, this most destructive and violent creature, when you can make him angels? And then look at the answer. And he said, God said, truly I know what you do not know. You know, in modern parlance we would say, I know exactly what I'm doing. I read that and said, what? You know what you do not know? You know exactly what you're doing? Well, please inform me. Tell me what you're doing. You can't just get off that easy. You can't just tell me you know exactly what you're doing. Not after what I've been through. Not after you made me this way. And then I realized, of course, I was arguing with a God I didn't even believe in. And that would happen several times as I read through the Quran. And sometimes I would just get into such... So I'm so agitated by what I read, I start arguing with this voice that's, that's, that I'm reading before me, that's calling to me. So we turn to the next verse. But it turns out that the Quran just doesn't dismiss the question. It starts to answer it a little bit. And in the next verse it says, And he taught Adam, God taught Adam, the names of all things. And then he placed them before the angels and said, Tell me their names if you are right. So this verse is clearly referring to the previous one. But notice what it says. And he taught Adam the names of all things. So here we see Adam is not only just a creature who knows how to name things, who's acquiring the gift of language, but he's also a learning creature. God is teaching him. Now right here, right in this verse, and it'll come even clearer in the subsequent verses, that the very first thing that the, that the Quran is going to emphasize here is man's intellect. He is a learning creature. He is taught. And what is he taught? What is, the, what is one of the great intellectual gifts he's given in response to the angel's question? The gift of language. Because through language, mankind can not only learn, but he could learn things not only through his own experience, but he could learn things that other people have experienced of times and places that are hundreds, thousands of years and miles separated from him. And so that all our knowledge becomes cumulative. Every generation learning from the generation before it. I'm learning today from authors I read from other sides of the world that may have existed 2,000 years ago. And so we all contribute to our collective learning and knowledge. And so what I'll see later in the Quran 
And the Quran will emphasize this again and again and again. Like in one verse it says, Read in the name of your Lord who created. Created a man out of a tiny creature that clings. Read, it commands the reader. For your Lord is most bountiful. Why is he most bountiful? What great gift did he give you? For he taught man the use of the pen. And through it taught him what he otherwise could not know. And he taught Adam the names of all things. And then he placed them before the angels and said, Tell me their names if you are right. Okay, you have this objection to, you have this natural question about this creation of mankind. Here, this mankind is a, this is a human being, this human creature is a learning creature. He has many intellectual gifts. Here, I'm going to place these things before you. Tell me their names if you are right about man. And what did the angel say? Glory to you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. In truth, it is you who are knowing the wise. They say this, is be, this task, this intellectual test that's put before them is beyond their grasp. And so in the next verse we read, And he said, Oh Adam, tell them, tell them their names. And when he had told them their names, notice how it's just like it's nothing for him. For mankind, he has this phenomenal ability. And that's clearly the point of these verses. Even though I, under, I felt that the author didn't quite, uh, you know, it was as if I, I realized that he didn't, not, just didn't misunderstand the story. He was taking one of the great stories in the history of humankind, one of the fundamental greatest stories in the history of mankind, and molding it and using it as a vehicle for an entirely original message. <clears throat> and God said, did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and what you conceal? In other words, didn't I tell you I know exactly what I'm doing? I looked at that. What question did their... I mean, what did they reveal and what did they conceal? Why are you all looking at me like that? <laughs> You're starting to scare me. You're all looking very serious. Am I losing you? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. So, they revealed the sinister and evil propensities of man. But what did their question conceal? And all you have to do is think about it for a minute. The human beings, yes, they could do evil. Yes, they could do wrong. Yes, they could create misery. But they could also do exactly the opposite. They could choose to do evil. They could choose to do tremendous good. They could choose to do tremendous violence. They could choose to show tremendous compassion. They could choose to be, to, you know, to live by falsehood. They could choose to live by the, the greatest truths. So we go on to the next verse. And behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam, and they bowed down. But not so Iblis, Iblis is like the father of Satan. He refused and was arrogant. He was of those who reject faith. An interesting statement. And notice why Iblis does not bow down. He refuses because he was arrogant. You know, we often hear the, what's the root of all evil? In the West, it's always money greed, etc. Here the Quran says that, seems to be saying that the root of all evil is not always material wants, it's not always money, it's not always greed. At the heart of evil is arrogance. Putting yourself above all others. Of assigning to yourself special priority and neglecting the rights of others. O oh Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden and eat freely thereof what you wish. But come then this, near this tree, for you will be the among wrongdoers. Then they make the mistake. But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. And we said, go all you down. Some of you being enemies of others will be adversaries of others. Some of you will be adversaries of each other. And on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. Let's go back from where we started. First, mankind is being taught. We see he's an intellectual being. Then we show he's a moral being. Moral being means he's a being that's going to have to make choices. And then God gives him this choice. It's not a huge deal. It's not the gravest sin in the history of humanity by any means. It's minor by any standards. They make it though. We see that God originally intended to put man on earth as his vicegerent. When does God finally put him on earth? What signals that he's ready to begin? He makes his first independent choice. It's not the worst deed in the history of humanity. It's minor on anybody's scale. But it shows that mankind is ready to act on his own.